So, hello, good morning, also from my part. Thanks for coming. What I would like to talk about is the new role of customers in finance. There have been a number of new developments out there in the financial markets and in investment opportunities, the opportunities that customers have to directly participate in the marketplace, including crowd investing, social trading opportunities. And I would like to address these aspects and, as Paul said, talk a bit about the risks and some opportunities related to this idea. So what is the idea behind this, behind this crowd investing? What's the idea behind social trading? If we talk about crowd investing, then we are to typically talking about a large group of individuals, so the so-called crowd, investing in new projects, startup projects, even individual private projects, and Typically, the idea behind that is every investor just contributes a small amount of money. And then by aggregating this, this money in the group, there will be a sufficient amount to finance a new project. What is invested in? A large part of the investment goes into individual private projects. But there are also a lot of small companies. There's entrepreneurial activity out there. and these. Entrepreneurs, they seek for finance and they might not have yet established a bank relationship. They might not have access to a lot of outside equity finance. So they seek finance via these crowdfunding opportunities. And in the entrepreneurial scene, in the crowdfunding scene, these, these ideas are, have very well been established. And for new ventures, for entrepreneurial activities, this crowdfunding idea has proved to be quite successful in financing projects. But so far, there's hardly been anything researched and discussed from the perspective of the investor, actually. So what are the risks from the investor's perspective? So if it's nice that uh, entrepreneurs, private persons, they get money to set up a new project, but what is then the investor's perspective on that? And so that's what I would like to talk about. There are different types of these crowdfunding or crowd investing opportunities. We'll, just say a few words about that. So there's equity and debt-based crowdfunding. Equity-based crowdfunding is basically you're, you're buying a share in that project. You're buying a part of that project. You're basically becoming an equity investor. If you, you engage in peer-to-peer -peer consumer or business lending, then you as a customer, as just an individual investor, you provide some loan, private loan, to either a private person, an individual person, or to a company. Then we're talking either about peer-to-peer -peer consumer lending or peer-to-peer -peer business lending. And these two parts are actually the crowd investing part of the idea, because these are actually investing opportunities, as you can invest in all other types of uh, financial securities in the marketplace. Beyond that, there are also these ideas of reward-based crowdfunding, where you also invest some money, but you do not expect a monetary return, but you expect some sort of reward. That might be in the sense of some pre-orders, so you're basically buying a product or ordering a product that will be delivered at some later stage to you, uh, an early version of that product, or some sample that you will get as reward on your investment. If you think of that as something that you can sell afterwards, then obviously you also think about something like a monetary return. But you can also th uh, think about services as rewards that are provided then to the investors or to those who provide the money. Or you, one type of reward is also some sort of recognition. Your name disappears then on the website of that project of that company, or you get a t-shirt or whatever in return for your investment. And this reward-based crowdfunding, there's, some will say it's an investment in as or other types of investments, but other, others will say it's not really investment. It's, it's basically you're buying something. You're buying a product. So that's why that's, that's a bit different from the overall investing idea. And last but not least, there's a, a group of donation-based crowdfunding, and that's donation, and then my, your name will be probably also stated somewhere that you've been 
uh, donating something for, for charitable social project. But that's actually not the investing idea of that part. So there's a bit more in that crowdfunding idea than just the crowd investing part. My idea is to focus on the crowd investing. How does that happen? Well, there are a number of crowdfunding platforms out there. Either you can characterize them already as uh, social platforms, social media platforms, or they cooperate with social uh, trading, uh, social media platforms in order to be able to promote their activities to get the crowd engaged in these activities. And the second trend in that context is so-called social trading. And this is something that has not yet been in the focus so much, at least in the, in the public attendance. And this is <coughs> the idea behind that social trading is that individual investors just publish their investment decisions. So they make their portfolio public, the investment decisions public to a group of other investors. So we have some signal providers and signal followers as other types of followers in social networks. And these followers just replicate the signal provider's portfolio. And this process is typically uh, an automatic audit ex uh, execution via brokerage house. So if you wish, so there are different, different ways to organize that. If you wish, you can manually replicate and follow these decisions. But there's a good deal of automatic uh, following and so-called copy trading or mirror trading in the market. And what does that mean now from the followers or customers' point of view? You're basically delegating your portfolio management to a third party, to the signal provider. But you're not transferring the money to that person, but you're keeping your money. And via the automatic order execution, you just follow what the other person is doing. So the, the portfolio management idea is the same as you have with a mutual fund or if you're following some some other uh, professional institutional investment, uh, but here in the sense that you're not actually transferring the money, but say you're following them. And what you can uh, characterize that is basically uh, some sort of hurt behavior. And there's been a lot of research uh, out there about hurt behavior might be beneficial to some investors if they do not have the expertise, if they can benefit from the expertise of other, others. But there's also some research out there addressing the shortcomings of this hurt behavior because investors just do not use their own information that they have. They just need to trust the information that is given by others. And that can create, obviously, some problems because new information is not really integrated in the market and so forth. And in particular, if you do not really know whether the person that you're following really has the expertise, has the insight, what is going on, what are the conflicts of interest, then you might run into trouble uh, from that point of view. And here again, social platforms, so-called social trading platforms are involved. They allow for this uh, publication of the signal provider's portfolio and investment decisions. They allow for the replication of these decisions some international, may, mainly international platforms active here. And how is it then done? Just via your brokerage account, via certificates on these uh, portfolios, uh, contracts for difference, binary options, all types of interesting financial instruments. Where I'm not sure if really every investor will be knowledgeable about what is going on in that context. So now you might ask, is that relevant at all? And I think it is. If you look at the numbers, the volume of crowd investing, the volume of social trading in Europe, then there has been a considerable increase during the last years. If you are talking about peer-to-peer -peer consumer lending, so remember this is a loan that one private person just provides to the other private person. That has been close to 300 million euros in 2014, with annual growth rates of around 100%. Growth rates are the same for other types here of this crowd investing activities. 
and also for reward-based crowdfunding, you see a good volume in the market. Obviously, if you compare that to the overall investment volume of investors, it's still a tiny percentage of that. Because, I mean, the overall investment volume goes in billions and uh, thousands of billions of euros. But still, there's a considerable growth, and growth in that market segment. So that's definitely something that's worth following uh, from a very early stage on. And if you think about this social trading, then data is a bit more scarce in that context. But the platform eToro, they have more than 4.5 million users worldwide. And if you think about uh, Wikifolio and a Vienna-based social trading platform, they had 9 billion euros in transaction volume since 2012. And they are not only attracting investors in their domestic market. Of course, you might think, okay, that's something Vienna-based, that's Austria, and that's Germany, and then you have eToro, they are actively uh, more internationally. And then you have some local crowdfunding platforms, and, but they are active internationally. On the lending perspective, it's a bit more regulated, and of, often there is a financial institution involved. So that's a bit more focused on the domestic market. But still, when it comes to equity-based crowdfunding, if it comes to reward-based crowdfunding, you're talking about cross-border transfer of money, cross-border investments, and that obviously creates some trouble in the international context. So what is now the new role of customers in that context? Well, first of all, there are some benefits in that. Investors suddenly get a broader variety of investment opportunities. So they can diversify their portfolio even further. They get access to investment opportunities that they had no access to before. Entrepreneurial activity, venture finance, loans, mainly unsecured to individuals. Obviously, you could provide a loan to just your neighbor, to your friend, whatever, already before. But now with it, idea of peer-to-peer -peer lending, peer-to-peer -peer consumer lending, it's getting a bit more standardized. You may even provide a loan to someone who you do not know, except for some information that is publicly available. So that's, that's one of the benefits. The other benefit is digitization. Everything is happening very quickly. It's very convenient. You're sitting at home, and you have the opportunity to, to invest in a number of these new activities. But there are also some things that are worth talking about when it comes to the risks or the shortcomings from the customers, from the investors' perspective. And one of these ideas, one of these problems, as I would call them, is they're typically less re regulated and supervised than other financial services. But still, we are talking about equity investment. We are talking about debt investment. So. Shouldn't we think about of some similar level of regulation from the con consumer's perspective? And what is very much linked to that idea and also very much linked to the aspect of digitization is that all these activities, they happen without financial advice. So, so far, if you go to your bank, if you are in contact with your investment advisor, you get on a regular basis an appointment, you get information about your portfolio, what is your portfolio composition, what are new investment opportunities. That has changed already a bit with more and more digitization already in the ordinary banking activities. But if you go further into that, if you fully automize things online, if you invest in these crowdfunding projects, if you invest via social trading platforms, then there's basically no financial advice involved. So consumers or customers, investors in that, in that sense, they need to find the information on their own, Inve information about the quality of the investment project, information about the contractual partner. So far, they've been in contact with a mutual fund. They've been in contact with a bank where they deposited their money. Now they need to think about all those guys who advertise their projects via these crowdfunding platforms. What is the quality? What is the motivation, the 
creditworthiness of these contractual partners. And they also need to think about the quality of the platforms. Because all these uh, crowdfunding platforms, social trading platforms, they are part of that value chain in that context. So the quality of these platforms, the control mechanisms that are in place, are also something that the investor just needs to find something out about. So the information needs to analyze that. And we are not only talking about the quality of the investment, the contractual partners and the platforms. We are also talking about the assessment of the own financial situation. And in that situation, it's getting highly critical because if without any financial advice, you would need information about your entire portfolio. You always would need to think about your entire portfolio and potential effects that these new investments have on your portfolio, on, your, on the overall risk and so forth. So what is your level of risk, risk tolerance? Do you have already sufficient investments for your old age provisions? Do you have secured just your regular income that you have uh, from, from your work life and so forth? So some things to talk about, to think about in this, this context. Motivation is not always clear on both parts. On the customer's part, might be monetary motivation, might be non-monetary motivation. Some investors might find it interesting to support entrepreneurial activities. They may maybe not even looking that much into monetary reward. They, so, so they might even be happy if they just are able to support entrepreneurial activity in that context. Others might not, and others might just invest because they think it's a good investment, they will earn a good return on the risk that they're involved in. So that's something uh, that is within the group of investors when it comes to conflicts of interest among those who invest, then that's something to think about. Motivation sometimes also not clear among the contractual partners of the customers. Um, that's what I uh, addressed before. So what is the problem or what are the problems? Because there are a number of problems associated to these questions uh, from the customer's point of view. First of all, we are talking about investments where there's the risk of a total loss. That's not different if you're talking about investing in a corporate bond, if you're talking about uh, investment into shares of stock. So that's not really new, but it's often not really obvious that there's this risk of total loss. There's no deposit protection for these peer-to-peer -peer consumer loans. There's no deposit protection for peer-to-peer -peer consumer lending. And there are estimates of up to 50% default probability for uh, equity crowd funded uh, startups within the first five years. Why I say estimates and why, why is it a bit critical? Because so far there has not been a lot of data available on how many of these projects really were successful because many of these problems are uh, problems. Many of these projects are still active. So we do not yet have final results on the cash flows that they generated and on the actual investment success or default of these uh, opportunities. So that's the overall setup. But when it comes now to the customer itself and the investor, so we are talking about individuals and they are not experts in finance, at least most of them. Some have an idea, they have a good education, they have a bit of an idea of what is going on in the economic and uh, financial arena, but they are not experts and they cannot be because if you think you need to be an expert in finance, then you might also think you need to be an expert in health issues, you need to be an expert in nutrition, you need to be an ex expert in car repair, everything else. So you cannot be an expert in everything. So we cannot expect customers that engage in these crowdfunding activities, social trading activities, to be experts in each and every area of life. Then there's, there has been a lot of behavioral research on limited cognitive capabilities of individuals and investors in the marketplace, bounded rationality of investors. So they're not really irrational in that sense. They, they try to be rational. They try to optimize their return given the risk that they are facing. 
But they will never be fully, ration, fully rational in that context because they cannot uh, analyze all the information that is given. They will never know the, all the information and get, cannot get at all the information that is out there. Then there's the question uh, that there's no financial advice. I addressed that. <coughs> and what is very interesting in that context as well, and that differentiates a lot of financial products from other products, is that we are talking about credence goods. So these are goods where you cannot say in advance, and you cannot say during the lifetime, and you cannot even say after the end of the life of that product what the actual quality is. If you think about an investment project uh, in some sort of uh, crowdfunded project, entrepreneurial activity, you're talking about some longer term investment. You will get some return for the risk, hopefully, uh, but it's really difficult to identify the quality of the project until you realize your final cash flow from that project. So you very much depend on trust and you very much depend on the quality of the information about the product or the project and your contractual partner. <coughs> what is highly critical in, uh, still in the context of these new activities, both on social trading side as well as on the crowdfunding side, is that the information that you get is hardly standardized. So you're, if you wish to compare two different projects, if you wish to compare different investment opportunities, old-fashioned investment opportunities with these new investment opportunities, you really run into trouble because there's some standardized information out there. And the idea behind, in particular, behind the crowdfunding projects is that there should not be standardized information out there. One big part of the movement of the, all this crowdfunding is that the, the, those who need the money they should provide individualized information. They should put a video out there. They should put a to-do list out there. They should provide some background information about the project. So I'm not sure how customers will be able to compare different projects, different investment opportunities, if there's just individualized information about all these projects out there. Control mechanisms, I addressed that before when I talked about the platforms. They are not really obvious. And sometimes I'm not sure if they are really in place when it comes to market supervisory and, and uh, regulation, but also then uh, internal control mechanisms within the, within the platforms. Some will say there's wisdom of the crowd. So if you get enough investors in there, then that says that a large number of investors has examined the quality of the project. And it's basically a sign of quality if there's a sufficient amount of money uh, gathered by our crowdfunding platforms. But if it comes to, or when it comes to empirical evidence on this wisdom of the crowd, then to be polite, it's at best mixed. Or to be not polite, it's a myth. There's no wisdom of the crowd um, putting together a large group of just individual investors does not really say anything about the quality of the project that's behind that. There might be conflicts of interest within the crowd because different types of investors, individual investors, they might have different interests when it comes to the risk return relationship, to the investment horizon. And we should not forget, although the idea behind that crowdfunding is that there are individual investors involved, often there are institutional investors involved as well. That's not that obvious for many of these uh, uh, who are investing in these projects, but often institutional investors look for these crowdfunding opportunities also to see what's in there for them. And they might have better opportunities to estimate the, the quality of these projects. They might even have opportunities to be first in line when it comes to allocation of these projects. So maybe then the, the crowd, the rest, the individual investors, they only get the rest that's in there and that might not be of best quality. When it comes to entrepreneurial activity, then even venture capitalist institutional investors face trouble when trying to invest the quality, uh, identify the quality of these projects, identifying the, those startups that will actually turn out to be successful. And if even these institutional investors have problems in doing so, 
how can we expect that the crowd will be able to do that? Do that? Mm -hmm. So from the investor's perspective, it, um, also some critical aspect to look into. There might be higher fraud risk due to the anonymity of the internet. That's, that's not yet been too, too much research on that part. And there's also some discussion about the enforcement of the rights of the, of the investors in that context. If you think of these platforms, many act internationally, as I said before, particularly when it comes to social trading platforms, when it comes to the equity-based crowdfunding platforms, they act internationally. So the question is which regulation, with which uh, jurisdiction applies, who is liable, and how long for the information that is provided. What happens if the project is not successful <coughs> and uh, the person might not be, you can, might not get access to any recourse here on, the, on that person. And beyond that, does the platform still exist? And there's movement in these platforms. We are not talking about three, four, five main platforms in that context. We're talking about hundreds of platforms that engage in these activities. And there's constantly some platforms disappearing and some new platforms coming up. So the role of these platforms in that overall process is also something uh, that should uh, get a bit more attention here, uh, in my opinion. Data security is with all types of uh, digital financial services, so that's nothing uh, to talk about in that context as something special. When it comes to actual analysis of the success of these platforms, of these investment opportunities, then there has not yet been a lot of research out there. And that's mainly due to lack of data. One reason is that even the platforms do not have, or many platforms do not have data about the success, about the, re the cash flows generated by these projects. So it's hard to analyze something that is happening. Then, as I said, a lot of projects are still new. The market has just grown recently to considerable numbers. So there's not really data about the, the overall projects out there. So that's connected to the short period. With uh, some colleagues in Germany, I had a look into this Wikifolio platform uh, with the, the social trading platform. We found out that on average there, these, these signal providers and then the followers, they do not do that bad. On average, they might even meet the market. But there's a considerable number of these uh, Wikifolios in that context that underperform, that strongly underperform. That does not say that they are bad, better or, or, or worse than mutual fund investors, uh, in investors or others, because there you also see a broad range of investment outcomes. But at least it does not tell anything about, or, or does not indicate that, there, that the social trading would generate some extra benefit, would generate some outperformance for the investors. So also we suffered from short in, uh, horizon for the analysis. Uh, we analyzed uh, up to three years performance of these Wikifolios. But as I said, nothing that would tell us that there's something uh, particularly uh, very beneficial going on for the investors. So my final question then, what to do? And that's something that I hope for some discussion then uh, afterwards on. Obviously, we can think about treating these crowd investing, social trading opportunities the same way as we treat other types of investments when it comes to regulation, when it comes to supervision. That might not sound uh, very attractive from the entrepreneurial perspective, from those who need the money, because they might fear more regulation, they might fear stricter regulation. But I think that also from that perspective, it might be beneficial if these entrepreneurs, if they are able to signal the quality of their projects in a uh, well-regulated market setting. I'm not necessarily talking about more regulation. I'm more talking about just applying the same regulation to different investment opportunities if these investment opportunities are so similar. Of course, if I invest in an equity investment in just a stock of company, or if I invest in an equity investment in the share of these new firms, these new startups, why shouldn't the same regulation apply? Then there's a lot of discussion going on, uh, in, in particular in the European context, about the product information. 
So providing comprehensible, comparable, and ver verifiable product information is definitely something that should be focused on, on the relevant characteristics. I'm not talking about prospectuses that are hundreds of pages. I'm talking about key investor information documents that provide key aspects, the key characteristics, relevant characteristics, telling people that they might lose 100% of their investment. Or even better, telling them if they invest a million Icelandic kroner, they might lose a million Icelandic kroner. Because that's obviously a bit more, uh, or, or what, what in investors understand a bit better, talking about money and not talking about returns in, in, in percentages. There should be some information about just the po portfolio impact. So what does it do to the other investments in the portfolio? And we could think about education and financial literacy. That's getting back to the discussion that uh, I intended before. Um, education, yes, to get provide individuals with some understanding of what is going on in the economy. But we will not be able to just keep everyone just up to date with everything that is going on in finance uh, and every new development. So there are definitely limits to education in that context, data security. And what we definitely need is more research in these areas. And so I hope also during the next years to be able to look into data a bit more, getting in contact uh, with those who might have the data, or, or even trying to identify how we can generate more data about these uh, platforms, about the investment opportunities, and so forth. That's it from my part. Thanks right. a lot. Thank you, Stefan.